Hello and welcome back to the Harry and Marcus pod- podcast. This is part two of the top 30 for June the 10th, 1973. We'll be counting down from number 15 to number one. Enjoy. Well, I'm sure you're on the next one. It's, the, it's a huge leap up from 37 to number 15. And it's Paul McCartney and Wings with uh, Live and Let Die from the film of the same name. It spent 11 weeks on the top 40, and its highest position was only number nine in this country. Um, obviously, there must be loads written about this. The main match I have here is uh, straight up on the story behind how he wrote it. All right, yeah. He was interviewed by uh, uh, one of the feed music magazines, Uncut Old Mojo. And he spoke spoke there. Of course, it's quite amazing, really, and give, gives an insight in, into him. Uh, they were recording, they were doing the sessions for the Red Rose Speedway. Yeah. And, and they had a, they had a, a break, so he'd been c- commissioned to do the song and everything for it. So they gave him another, another book. James Bond book he'd not read and he sort of speed read it uh, during that session that one session uh, he said it was quite an easy easy read so he managed to read the, the whole thing uh, and and he wrote the song the next day <laughs> right right <laughs> which is uh, 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 amazing uh, he explained that Really, the most difficult part about it was how to fit the title "Live and Let Die" in 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 to to the song. Uh, and the only way it started to work was when, as a sort of follow-on from "Live and Let Die," was he thought of a "Live and Let Live," and, w- and once he got both of those. It all made sense, and he 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 can make it follow into a song. Yeah. Uh, and at the end, of it, he said, "Yeah, I really think that it came out. It, it was quite easy to do." And he just thought he's lucky he'd not been given the quantum of solace to write. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's a I thought it's a really good, really good story. Mm-hmm. And, uh, how the song came about i um as i said to you just now i saw him play it live of course yeah oh yeah yeah can we at at wembley at wembley yeah the what i'm about to say now is on wikipedia so it's not necessarily true but um um it says like you said about him reading the book um but it said that uh schultzman wanted uh shirley bassey or thelma houston to perform it So McCartney got around that by having written in the contract that his version would be over the opening credits. And there is another version of the song in the film, which is performed by B.J. Arnu. Um, but, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but it was meant to be performed by Fifth Dimension, but they couldn't do it. Um, if that's true, that's what it says on Wikipedia. Anything else you got about it? Not really, but I'm oh, interested to look it up more because... These songs are always a, a collaboration with uh, John uh, Barry. So I guess Paul McCartney wrote the song Live and Let Die. And that all of the this, this string arrangements and stuff were added in collaboration with John Barry. But I might be wrong. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't, it mentions George Martin on the uh, Wikipedia thing, but... Oh, it it's the first, oh, thanks for saying that. It's the first time they'd worked together for a while. It, what was that? Yeah. All right, so now we go one that uh, was a massive single in that year, but it's going down this week from number nine to number 14. Tie a yellow ribbon round the old oak tree by Dawn featuring Tony Orlando. Um, spent a massive 35 weeks on the top 40 and four of them at number one. Um, far away. He couldn't really escape this at, 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 uh, at 
the, the time, could, 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 could you? Haven't got a, a lot about this, but it's the, 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 uh, the story, isn't there, that, you know, it's based on a real fact, but it's probably on a sort of American sort of myth sort of sort of thing uh, yeah. about this thing happening. But the writer, I can't remember, Erwin Le- Levine. Oh, yeah. The yeah. writer was, was uh, Larry Brown. But Erwin uh, read this version of the story from a, a read, Reader's Digest in now January 1972. I thought it was a good story to uh, write a song about. I'm just looking uh, at them on, on, on the, uh, the page. It says songwriters, the bloke you just said, Brown and L. Russell. Would that be Leon Russell or would that be another Leon? I can't imagine Leon Russell writing this. No, that's the other name that Larry Brown goes by. Is oh, right, L. Right. Russell Brown. Right, but the one I was thinking about was Erwin L- Levine, the other writer. Right, and the only other thing I've got on it is uh, it's apparently, according to or the 2008 Billboard ranking, it was the 37th biggest song, biggest selling song of all time in America. Um, yeah, yeah. which yeah. Uh, shows it must have shifted some copies. But uh, like you said, I you liked can... Dawn uh, uh, back in the day. Yeah, yeah. You know, they, 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 not, you, three times, not three times. Yeah, yeah. I what you're doing Sunday. Yeah. Stuff like that. I was like corny songs, but uh, I think we discussed them before, weren't we? At Tony Orlando, he'd had a hit earlier, but he became a sort of music executive and sort of then came back into this with an idea with, uh, I think we, we were talking about not three times. Yeah, uh, yeah. And that, that's where it came about. He came out of sort of singing re- retirement and uh, obviously was far more successful than he, he'd ever been before. And now we uh, go one to one that is stuck in the same place. 13 last week, 13 this week, and one that I personally would call a classic, Walk on the Wild Side by Lou Reed. Um, spent eight weeks on the top 40 and reached number 10 and famously was produced by David Bowie and Mick Ronson, and I'll leave the rest to you. Yeah, I was reading re- re- an interview with uh, Lou Grease at the top. <laughs> oh, God, strange, strange days in 1973. He was over here in London in 73, and guess, guess who he was interviewed by? <laughs> No, no I you won't, you won't get Roger Greenaway. Oh, right, <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, it's, a, it's a song that's about sort of, uh, you, know, you know, drag queens coming to New York and becoming prostitutes and a bit of a, you know, classic gay song at, yeah, at yeah. the time and it was... Uh, a lot of Lou Reed's you now struggling with his homosexuality, and uh, it, it comes out that his, his parents tried to uh, have, have him treated to cure him from homosexuality right, right. Uh, yeah, yeah. back in the days. But I don't want to get too heavy on that, but it's a really interesting story. All around it and stuff, and all the people mentioned in the song were all actual actual people. Polly, uh, Candy, a, a, a little Joe, li, little Plum, and and uh, Jackie. Were, yeah, were were all people in the. Uh, the Andy Bird Warhol circle, they're all the part of his now factory. And some of them were, appeared in his films, a few of them have appeared in Flesh. And uh, Holly, uh, who came a bit later, appeared in uh, uh, Trash. So it's all right. very, very much 
round, 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 round that, that scene. But, yeah, uh, there's a list here of their names. Uh, Holly was Hollywood Woodlawn, a yeah. transgender actress. Candy was based on Candy Darling, a transgender actress. Little Joe was the nickname of Joe Dallistero, an actor. Yeah. Um, Sugar Plum Fairy was also an actor, Joe Campbell. And Jackie was Jackie Curtis, uh, another Warhol actress. Yeah. And Speeding and Crushing were references to Curtis's drug addiction at the time. Um, but what really surprised me was that they got away with it with the BBC, especially that line about giving head. I mean, BBC banned everything that's even slightly sexual. And in 1973, this one never played on the radio all the time. Well, it's, there were jokes about it in no the 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 middle pre uh, in in the the music press weren't there at another time. Uh, well, it wasn't banned. It got loads of airplay. Yeah, yeah. It was always on the radio at the time. But anyway, well, every it's, it's a it's a great single and it's it's a nice story. Of, about the sax solo. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, played by uh, Ronnie Ross, who was David Bowie's saxophone teacher. When oh, he yeah, yeah I've read that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he, he brought him in and he just did, did it in uh, one single take. Yeah, I read somewhere that uh, he, Ronnie Ross turned up for the session but he didn't actually know who David Bowie was because he obviously taught him yes. David Jones and then he didn't realise uh, uh, who he was till he got there. But that is, that's uh, amazing that he did it in just one session. So now we go a complete change oh, of... Uh... Just, to, just to say there is a really good early acoustic version of this from 1971 on YouTube. Oh, right. People I'll want to listen that out. I'll, I'll look that one out because that sounds really interesting. Yeah, it is. It's uh, it sounds faster, but the vocal sounds. It's just because they're in his, they're in his, uh, flat. You know, he had one of those massive yeah, flats. Yeah. They, they're just a few of them playing guitar there, and he's playing it. What must have been a really early, early version of it. So it's an interesting uh, listen. I'll give that one a listen tonight. Um, now we're going to change, uh, well, change art style, artists, and everything else, and go for up from twenty-five to number twelve. Snoopy versus the Red Baron by the Hot Shops on the Mooncrest label, and Again. it was uh, twelve weeks in the top forty and peaked at number four. And uh, was that was this the right one that was a reggae version? Yeah, oh, right. yeah, 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 yeah. Which so, wasn't, which wasn't by the uh, Hot Shots. Oh right, right, right. It was actually the uh, C- Cinnamons with with Clive Crawley, who has produced it and sang the 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 the, the no vocal on it, and the Hot Shots were just basically brought in to appear on top of the pops. Right, right, right. They needed a, they needed a band. Very much like a, a lot of other bands. I mean, I'm trying to think off the top of my head who, who else did that. Uh, I was going to say um, the Archies, but they were always a cartoon band. Yeah. Um, um, I suppose, really... Right. The, the Simmerons were a, a proper no, Jamaican band, and uh, Clive Crawley was... Heavily involved in uh, Trojan. Oh yeah, yeah. And stuff, but did a lot of work. It looks like he did some. He obviously went out to to Jamaica and did this. I guess he did the recording, bought it back, and needed a band for for Top of the Pops. Uh, and the Hot Shots, the actual band, were an actual band, and they were originally called uh, Wild. Country had a recording contract and had, didn't have any success. And afterwards, they were called Al, Albatross, and they had equally no success with that. But they got their appearance on Top of Pops. And if you if you look at the clip, there's actually no. There doesn't seem to be any no connection 
with them. The guy sitting at the piano singing the song, Clive Crawley, and the other people just seem to be doing their own thing. They don't even sort of look at another singer. They're down, <laughs> right, they're right. Next to it's worth, worth looking to see if you see what I see, but uh, I'm just I looking and I don't think there's a scandal at the time, but I, I, I think uh, there's a bit of, of re- resentment on the treatment of the you no know, the, the Cimarron's over for this, yeah, yeah. I've, uh, I'm looking on, uh, on Wikipedia and there's absolutely nothing about this version. It's all about uh, the Royal Guardsman's version, yeah. which I assume is the original. Yes, it is, uh, yeah. Um, but apparently the Royal Guardsman tries to milk it dry by coming out with other Snoopy-themed songs like uh, The Return of the Red Baron, Snoopy's Christmas, Snoopy for President. And in 2006, they even released Snoopy versus Osama. So... Uh, uh, they really oh, find them that one dry. But now we can go up a place to number 11 and to another beetle. George Harrison with the great Give Me Love, and in brackets, Give Me Peace on Earth, peaked at number eight and spent nine weeks on the top 40, um, obviously on Apple, and uh, far away. It's not uh, my love off of the number one spot. All oh, right. 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 Uh, first time a beetle would not to... Uh, now beat off the number one spot but i am just saying that off the top of my head you know <laughs> no you are I... correct because i'm actually reading that exact line now on my screen in front uh-huh. of me so you're 100 percent correct yeah it's basically a sort of sp- spiritual song uh by me is heavily into a uh, hinduism at the time but uh very much like his uh my sweet lord but in this one, he he doesn't mention Harry Krishna. He just mentions Lord. Yeah, he's Lord Lord in in no 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 this one, but uh, uh, he's like that. Didn't like it as much as my sweet Lord, but wasn't offensive or sort of anything. And the t- you know tones okay about it. He had a good good. Good bands playing on it. He had Ed, 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 Nicky Hopkins playing yeah, piano, yeah, yeah. Klaus Foreman, who's uh, a drummer. I know his name, you've probably got the list in front of you there. Uh, but Ed, I haven't, but I will in two seconds if I go down to yeah. uh, the other keyboard now. player was um, that guy. Gary Wright. Gary Wright was the keyboard player who had a a couple of solo hits in yeah, yeah. in the States. And um, Jim Jim Keltner on drums. Keltner, that's it. That's what I was thinking about. He he was saying about playing no no drums on it and saying uh saying uh George Harrison was the ge- the easiest guitarist to follow. Really right. easy and stuff and he's really laid back, he's no drumming on it and when he finished it he thought was a Right now we've cut the track. Now let's redo no V drums properly. But they they loved V V drumming and it sort of went through. But he thought it was he was really laid back on it. It's, a, it's quite often you read that that they they do like demos or they do like what they think are going to be just practice and then they end mm. up using it. But it's a famous one with the Clem Catini when he. Uh, it, it mucked up, shaking all over, but it sounded oh, yeah. so yeah. good, so good they kept it in. Yeah, different different times. We were speaking, speaking about the 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 immigrant song by Neil Sedaka earlier. Yeah, different, yeah. different views and stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm sure. Even though we still had really terrible people had really terrible views back then in '73. But it wasn't the hate coming down from the top. Um, and now we're hitting the top ten, which uh, is number ten last week and number ten this week. Walking in the rain, a cover version by the Partridge Family. It peaked at number ten. This was its highest point, and it spent nine weeks on the top forty. Um, I'll obviously uh, say because it's in front of me, it's on the Bell label. Uh, and apart from that, I'll leave the rest to you. Yes, yeah, quite a f- few. Bell, Bell, 
build traps. We had, haven't we? First choice, Dawn, this one, a couple of others, I, I no, no, no believe. This song it was a, a cover version. It was written by uh, Cynthia Vile, Barry Mann and Phil Spector uh, back in 64. Uh, it must have been written as recorded by the, the, the Gronettes uh, and uh, Ronnie Spector. Uh, was in an in an interview talking about when when I made the recording and actually they're all in the studio, Cynthia, Barry, and obviously Phil because he's a producer, and they were writing the song at the time and handing the, the lyrics o- over to her to well, to the the Gronex to, uh, 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 to sing. Uh, so, so that, that, that that's a quite an interesting way way to get something done. But other versions of the the Walter Brothers, all oh, right, yeah, seven, did, did a version of this, the uh, Reporter and the 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 Del Rons did 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 a version, and uh, Jay and the Americans also had a. A top ten hit with this in in the, the states in the the music press at the time. There's a lot of talk about uh, the future of the Partridge Family because uh, uh, David Cassidy started doing a bit more solo stuff. All uh, oh, right, yeah, this yeah. time, and his management committee kept saying he still has a year to run. On, on the Partridge family contract. So I'm not sure if it does work out if, if he did uh, go on into 74 with the Partridge the family. The Partridge family were actually quite successful, weren't they? I mean, I, know, I don't know if it was because of David Cassidy's success, but they had quite a few hits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a, it was a big American show. I, I used, used to watch it, I recall. Yeah. Bit, uh, they're actually based the Partridge family. That's basically the Cowsills story, who are an, an an American family who used to go round the country in a van and perform all over the place. They had loads of hits in you know, the late sixties, and that's right, where right. that's where the story was sort of taken from and turned turned into a Partridge family. Right, so now we're up to number nine, down from number seven last week. It's uh, Stevie Wonder with You Are the Sunshine of My Life, which spent, uh, where are we, nine weeks on the top 40, and it reached number seven uh, on the very prolific Tamla Mersan label. And I've got no notes at all because um, we've had another power cut and my computer is uh, still trying to start up, so it's all up to you. Okay, uh when uh, when Stevie Wonder used to go to uh, 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 New York, he always had uh, uh, some studio space blocked out in Electric Ladyland Studio. And this is where they uh, recorded this uh, with Ray Parker Jr. playing g- guitar. All oh, right, or- I didn't know that. On this, what are you doing now? Do now. See, he, he, you learn something every week on our shows. Even I learn something every week on our shows. <laughs> uh, it might even be in Ud, Ud Wikipedia. <laughs> As uh, we've said before, the opening vocals on this is Jim Gilstrap. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, Lorna Groves is is the female, and then Stevie comes in late, 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 later on. Uh, no, it's a great, a great single. I mean, Tamlet turned out such good song, but this was Stevie Wonder. This wasn't the Tamler machine churning out this. This is Stevie Wonder. Doing it, apparently, it's written about your sunshine of my life about Sirita 
who'd, who'd write. Yeah. His, 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 his wife at the time, although there's differing stories about when they uh, uh, divorced. One says they divorced in 73. Uh, Sarita says uh, they divorced in 75. But she started at Tamla Motown as a s- secretary, but within a year she was writing songs. She wrote Sign Seal Delivered with Stevie Wonder. I did she? Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, went on to do lots of recordings and stuff. In fact, last week I got my copy of uh, Your Kisses Sweet. Oh, yeah, yeah. As yeah. A, a hit in a lovely uh, reproduction sleeve, which is good. Oh, you love reproduction sleeve, don't you? Oh, oh, that's it's beautiful. Re- it's like it's brand new. It's lovely. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's on a pile of sleeves to throw out, but there we go. Um, just going back to Stevie, um, I, I really liked his uh, his stuff um, around uh, the early, around the seventies. I mean, I'm trying to think now. Now I've said that, I can't think. Superstition and uh, um, what's, it, what's that one? Living in the city and that. There was, he yeah. did such. He was just did such really really good singles in the higher uh, life. Is it? Yeah, yeah. Higher love. No, high higher ground. Life. High ground. I ground. Oh dear. How, how many other songs have I been through? <laughs> I've got, uh, now a bit of Steve, Stevie Winwood in there. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. Oh dear. Right. So um, that was uh, Stevie, and now we go up. Up from number eleven to number eight is a brilliant song, "Stuck in the Middle with You" by Steelers Wheel. Got to number eight and spent uh, ten weeks on the top forty. Obviously. Um, the only two members of Steelers Wheel I know, the picture in front of me on my phone is of five people, but the only two I know are Joe Egan and Joe Rafferty, but you're going to tell us some interesting facts, I'm sure. I certainly am, with with this one. Uh, have you seen the video for it? No. When we're having the food fight. And it's really oh, yes, weird. I have, yeah, sorry. I have. Now you said the food fight. No, yeah, I have. Yes, yeah, horrible thing, but uh, it was... Uh, it's written by uh, Jerry Rafferty and no, Joe e- Egan, but it was uh, done as a joke. It was never actually sort of meant to be a, a single or sort of anything. And it's if uh, after reading this, I it went back and and listened to it, and I I can hear it now. It's a parody of Bob Dylan, right? It's right. Bob Dylan going to a cocktail party. And not, right, not, being, right. not being happy with it, and when you listen to it again, you can hear Jerry Rafferty's doing a Bob Dylan impression. The way he raises his voice at the end of a line, like a, a Dylan did. Uh, so I advise you to listen to it again. I will do now because now you said this. that it's completely changed my uh, my. A whole perspective on the song. I never ever thought there was a it was a Bob Dylan parody. Yeah, and it's a uh, old story about a, a dress of wild dogs and stuff. But the most amazing thing I found, I I didn't know, and you probably know it, but it's produced by Libran's Dollar. Oh yeah, I've that well now my screen's come back up. I no, can see that. You, you I, that yeah. I, I wouldn't have known it if I, my screen hadn't popped back up. But um, did they do a lot around that time, or they, was it just like a one-off? No, this is off off of their LP, weren't it? Which got in the charts and made fit Star. Yeah, Star was a good single. I like that. Yeah, that's a good single. No, they they, they did they did loads of stuff, but it wasn't really. Uh, they were oh, still... sorry, no. When I said did they do a lot of stuff around that time, I meant leave a stroller. Were they were they sort of back producing a lot of artists at that time? I, I, like a I, I, I don't know. It's it's a funny thing, isn't it? You you think oh, Librans dollar producing them, but it's only ten twelve years after they were doing Elvis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That stuff in the states, so <laughs> they probably weren't even. You know, 
I don't know, it might have been 40s or no, 50s, 60s, you know. I, 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 do, that all, I do that all the time. Um, I, uh, I sort of sit there and think, shit, when we started buying records, you know, the Beatles had only split up two years ago. But mm. now, you think, now you think of the Beatles as being like ancient history. And I suppose when you get to our age, you just forget that back when we started buying records, rock and roll and, and rock music was only like 15 years old. Uh, basically, now we get to another old man, um, Perry Como, with And I Love You So. Down from number four to number seven, it reached number three and spent 23 weeks, which is quite a long time, in the top 40. And a totally unrelated uh, story to Perry is, isn't this the album that uh, Pete got signed for my mother? Oh, dear. It must be. Yeah, my, um, just as a little backstory, my mother was a massive Perry Como fan and uh, the drummer in our band was on TV in a show, which we won't go into now, um, and claimed that he knew Perry Como or he'd met Perry Como. No, he was doing a concert. He was after this. He was about 75. Oh, right, right. When he, when he was mixing with his other music people back then and going to these sort of things, and he, he was going to the Perry Como concert and was going to get, get it signed yeah yeah my mother cherished that album so the day she died she never yeah. knew that he signed yeah. it <laughs> so i suppose yeah. it that's it, good for, uh, for your mum yeah it, yeah it, yeah it she good. never knew yeah. but uh peter signed him not perry anyway give us some uh give us some facts on and i love you so not a lot really it's a don a, a mclean song as 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 you you know uh, and there's lots of earlier, earlier versions, early cover versions. Don McLean uh, released it in 1970, and in that time before Perry did, did his version, you've got uh, Bobby Goldsborough who uh, uh, did a version, Helen Reddy, uh, Shirley Bassey, Bobby Vinton, and and the great Thal Dunican all did versions before Perry. Yeah, well, per Perry's the one that I know. Right, oh. now, the highest new entry of the week, uh, n at number six, the T-Rex with the Groover, which, is, as we've discussed up there, is probably the beginning of the end for their, their chart supremacy. But um, it peaked at number four, but only spent seven weeks on the top 40. It literally came in the top 10, and two weeks later, it got to, uh, it was out the top 10 and then disappeared. And um, as we said um, off air, discussing Bolan, um, this is probably... Uh, did you like the Groover? Uh, I listened to it the other day, and it's... Uh, it's it is classic T-Rex glam. Uh, in style, I, you know, I didn't p particularly like it, but the lyrics are totally nonsensical over uh, the the glam sort of uh, riff with a catchy chorus. So it's a uh, tis a uh, classic uh, glam uh, bowling at uh, 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 the time. Did you like it? Uh, at the time, I liked it, but not as much. I, I, I compare it to Slade and Squeeze Me, Please Me and Come On, Feel The Noise. I loved Come On, Feel The Noise, but I wasn't a fan. I liked Squeeze Me, Please Me, but I just didn't think it was that great. And oh, no, I was... really didn't like Squeeze Me, Please Me. That was, and I, 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 that I was some... churning something out. It, I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I had the same sort of feeling with this. Like, I loved 20th Century Boy and, you know, Telegram Sam and that. But this one just seemed like it was just getting a bit tired by now. Uh, it was okay, but it wasn't my favourite yeah. T-Rex single. Well, actually, course, reading the record Mirror at the time, it's interesting insight on this one, is that he had 50,000 ad advance all, all orders. All right. And... Uh, AMI were having major problems at the time with their pressing plant. I don't know if there was a no strike or... 73 or, or the strikes going on, weren't they? Or the uh, power cuts. <clears throat> so I don't know. I haven't been able to find that. But there's something because the no production, 
affected this, it affected Paul McCartney, uh, Live and Let Die, which would have probably gone gone up higher uh, this week, and also affected the, uh, you know, the Geordie single, which was out. All right. Can you do it? Can you do it, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that it affected that, that as, as, as well. Uh, so much so with this one that to keep up with the demand, uh, they had to have copies pressed in Holland. Right, right. So, uh, so as with, a my, with my collector's hat on, I'm, I've already been looking up, tracking down the uh, Holland pressings to get a get a UK and Holland pressing in my my collection. So. Uh, Considering it's Bolan and T-Rex, there's very little on my friend Wikipedia. There's just one paragraph. It's basically saying that it was never on, it was never originally on an album track, but it has No, been. that's right. No, it's not. It's obviously on later yeah. compilation it's albums. Been, um, but... it's, been, it's been released as bonus track on Tanks and yeah. Tink Alloy yeah. in, when they were re-released. And apparently it was the last T-Rex single to enter the sub-10. Um, yeah, that's what, I, that's what I was... Same, same to you. I can't think of anything after this which made the top 10. New York City and stuff with that did make the top 20 because I have to buy him, but uh, yeah, they yeah. certainly didn't make the top 10. Although, who knows, he may have come back bit, even bigger if uh, he hadn't have had that unfortunate crash because of the Mark, sh- the Mark TV show and lots of punk bands were citing him as an influence, especially the damned, so maybe he would have uh, made a comeback, but that's one of those uh, sad things we'll never know. Yeah. The, the next thing is, uh, next thing, the next record is up from number six to number five. It's a re release, uh, the 1973 release of Albatross by Fleetwood Mac. And this particular um, release spent 13 weeks on the top 40 and reached number two. I don't know what the original release did. I've got no information on that in front of me. Um, but uh, you're going to let us know about this one. Yeah. The, the original uh, released in 1968 got to, to number one. And I was thinking, I've got no way of proving it um, unless one of our listeners knows. Is this, at the time, the most successful uh, original and re-release single? Because the original got to number one and the re-release got to number two. Off the top of my head, I'd probably say you're probably right because I can't think of any re-release. Well, that, Bohemian uh, Rhapsody later on. Oh yeah, yeah, they both uh, got to number one. Yeah, but that was my sweet lord. But at the time, here in '73, yeah, you know, there's re-releases which have got to number one, but perhaps the original didn't hardly chart it. But yes, yeah, got yeah. to number one and number two within five years. What are your um, your thoughts on Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac versus the much more polished Americanized later Fleetwood Mac? Oh, it's hor- horrible thing to say, but I'd really, really, really like some songs by the newer Fleetwood Mac. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go your own way, and uh, 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 I. I I like some. I was never a big fan of Al Albatross. Uh, I liked though well, and I liked. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, but... well, he's good in places. Didn't yeah, really like yeah. the slow bit. I, I think a lot of it is also um, Peter Green was obviously a, a great blues guitarist. And, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you like you get you get the Stones and Keith Richards. Apparently, has a, an amazing personal collection of blues albums, really rare and really you know that he's tracked out over the years. But I've never personally been massively into the blues, so I prefer the new Fleetwood Mac because it's more poppy and more you know rock orientated. Yeah, yeah, they really did do some good. That not not some year one to very clearly a, 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 a classic band. And, and everything, uh, and mm, yeah, I was just going to say there is a little sort of personal connection because Peter Green did live locally to us, didn't he? He did, yeah, yeah. He's now very, very, very easily around the corner. 
from me when I was in there for a week. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, not for long. He lived by that playground. Yeah, house yeah. There. Didn't, no, didn't he? You used to, used to um, uh, see him sitting here. I mean, he, he, I don't think he actually was a, you know, homeless tramp sort of thing, but he just used to like sitting out on the, on the pavement and people used to st- stop and chat to him. Because someone I used to work with at uh, Kew Gardens said that he saw, the, saw him sitting outside 7-Eleven in Twickenham and he actually thought he was homeless and went to give him some money and he turned him down and said, no, I don't want the money. I'm just sitting here enjoying the day. And he said who he was now and don't chat him for an hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, when they all decided to, to do that tribute gig for him, he weren't into it and he just went round his mate's place for a cup of tea and a chat. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. And left them all to, all to do his you no know, tri- tribute concert. There you go. But it's a it's a classic single, and uh, I'll try and do some research on that. But I'm I'm pretty sure that is the most successful original release and re-release at 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 the time. So now we hit the famous top four, and the uh, down from number three to number four. One and one is one by Medicine Head. Um, peaked at number three, spent 11 weeks in the top 40, and I may be getting this wrong, but weren't these local guys, or one of them local guys as well? Uh, am I getting that wrong? I thought John, John Fiddler came from some Strawberry Hill or something, or am I getting that wrong? Yeah, I, 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 I've... That, that sang in you know, the back of my my, my mind, no, no, somewhere. But uh, I know, obviously, the Straubs were, but maybe it was something to do with them. But um, anyway, information on this one. Uh, not a lot. This is, uh, they were, they started off as, as, a, as, a, du- as a, a duet, John Fiddler and uh, Pete uh, Hope Evans. So you've probably got that in, in front uh, of you. And they got... Uh, they, don't, they only say John Fiddler's name. Um, well, it's uh, Peter Hope Evans is the uh, is the harmonica juice harp player and is a predominant juice harp in this one. What's the other single you can think of? Well, I'm, I'm, I, you see, I'm going to show you. I, I can't say that now because in front of me it's got these singles chronological. And the one before it was on the land, and the one after it was Rising Sun. So now I'm reading it. I remember Rising Sun, but if I if I didn't have this screen in front, no, of that me, isn't what I was that. asking. Oh, I was, right. I was asking, what's another single you can re- remember a, a Jew's heart being played on? Oh, uh, the Who. Yeah, um, joined uh, together. Joined together. Yeah. 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 yeah it's only one I I I I I I could think. What's fascinating how yeah, you go about re- recording that. I suppose you just. It's loud enough. You put a microphone up to it, uh, but there you go. But uh, they were a, they were a duo gigging around, sent a tape in to John Peel, uh, who heard the demo, liked it, and signed him to his dan- Dandelion la- 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 label. And uh, they went up. After this, after Rising Sun, they sort of expanded out to a five piece and had Rob Townsend from Family playing drums. For All right, them. right. With others, and then they went back down to a duo and stuff. And later on, uh, John Fiddler joined the British Lions. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember yeah, them. With members from Erd Mott. And uh, Peep. Peter Hope Evans did some soundtrack work with Pete Townsend late, late, later on. But uh, this single came off of the album uh, 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 One and One is One. Uh, but their previous album in 1972 was called Dark Side of the Moon. Oh, was it? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, that's, that, that I, is the unsuccessful dark side of the right moon. The moon. And now we're hitting the top three. Down from number one last week, number three this week. See my baby jive by Wizard. Four weeks at number one. Fourteen weeks in the top forty. And again, it was a song that was everywhere at the time. Um, I loved it because I love glam rock. Um, I'm sure there are a few little fact factoids about this one. 
yeah, yeah. Uh, it, he was in Roy Wood was in uh, e, ELO for sort of one single, uh, and uh, long enough for him to go out and buy loads of uh, cheap cellos uh, to play on uh, one o. What's it? What's it? One o five three eight. One o five. five. Uh, three eight, which is uh, them, uh, Jeff Lynn, Roy Wood, and Bev Bevan playing the 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 cello. I I think for eight for ages getting getting that done, and uh, the only one who lasted for pace right through the song was Bev Bevan. All oh, right. So uh, that's perhaps, but that, that's on the cruiser. But uh, for for musical uh, differences. Uh, Roy Wood left in uh, 72. Uh, they both managed by Don R. Arden uh, at the time, and Roy Wood went to meet uh, Don Arden and say what his plans were. And he said he's had this idea of uh, forming a band uh, called Wizard, but all it was at the moment was an idea. And he then went out and created uh, the Navioc Tet, the eight members of the Wizard, uh, two drummers, two horn players, and 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 stuff in it. And uh, people going about him doing the Phil Spector wall, wall of sound, but he said, uh, when you've got an octet doing all of that, there's nothing really else you can really do apart from the, the Phil Spector wall of sound or all, 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 all those instruments. But their, uh, their first appearance was at the, the, the Wembley Ud, Ud Rock and Roll concert. Oh, yeah. In yeah. 1972. That's when they, they first appeared. And then the first single comes out after that ball, ball park incident. Uh, have you ever owned a copy of that thing? I'm sure you've had several copies, as have I, that doesn't jump. Uh, I can't tell you. I've had it, but I can't remember if it jumped or not. All my copies you now jump in exactly the same place. Really, really irritating. But uh, there must have been one that doesn't jump because it got played on Radio 1. I, yeah, I, yeah. I don't, don't recall those jumping. Uh, but uh, as I say, after the ballpark incident, uh, see my baby jive no a, a, a great single first number one after you know its second single in a number one and went on doing angel fingers that's right a lot, lot of lot of good stuff too he sort of lost his way a, a, a bit late 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 later on Yep, the only uh, other thing which I've got on here, which is uh, not really about Roy Wood, but apparently uh, ABBA acknowledged that uh, after the disappointment of Ring Ring in, in 72, when they entered the Eurovision for some contest of 73, whenever it was, they uh, they got inspiration from this song for Waterloo, that, um, and they used two drummers and uh, to and they double track the guitars and everything to make the sound bigger and fuller. Yeah. And uh, and basically, they they cite "See My Baby Jive" as the inspiration for Waterloo, which mm, um, cool. I uh, wouldn't have known if I hadn't read it here. So uh, now we are into the all important top two. Up from number five to number two is Ten CC, who we talked about earlier um, with Rubber Bullets. Got to number one, um, spent 12 weeks on the top 40, and uh, there's obviously quite a bit of information about this lot. Yeah, this one was a bit of a controversial single at the time. The rubber bullets with the Northern Ireland conflict at the time. Uh, but everyone thought the, the rubber bullets part of it was about Northern Ireland. And yeah. uh, Eric Stewart was amazed it wasn't banned, give, yeah, given, that, yeah. given the feeling at, at, at another time. But it, it wasn't 
is a great singer. A lot of people say as an A and A and B side, it's it's waterfall on the B side. I reckon that's one of the strongest singles they ever did. Yeah, because the B side's so good, which is yeah, an Eric, yeah. Eric Stewart and Graham Gould and song. But the uh, they wrote this. Uh, the the basic part of the song was Lowell Cream and Kevin Godley round uh, Kevin God Godley's mum's house. Uh, Lowell Cream had, uh, had, had an old uh, tatty acoustic, and they managed to write the chorus and a couple of lines of the the, the verse, uh, and they they like. They liked the chorus. They thought that was going to work, so they they joined up with the others. And you know, you know Graham Gould and there was obviously a, 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 a great songwriter from the sixties in his own right. Added some of his he Graham Gould and wrote a bit about the balls and chains. Yeah, I read that. He said uh, he said that uh, he, he he considered it to be one of his finer couplets. Yeah. Uh, so that that was it. Ready, it was a you no know, strawberry studio production. So, as most of the stuff, I take it it it, it was recorded there. Yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, it's the only number one single, and um, that J- Jonathan King had had any involvement in. Because it was his, oh, right, la- right. Yeah, yeah. his his label, which leads us to the top position, and we are uh, number two last week, number one this week. Susie Potro with her debut number one, or first number one. It wasn't a debut single. Um, spent eleven weeks it's in a, the top forty. A debut, debut hit. Yeah, debut hit. Yeah. yeah um, Rolling 11 Stone. Weeks. Uh, 11 weeks top 40, and uh, obviously you got to number one, and on the rack label, which I believe you collect. I do. I, I do. I'm up around the 110 mark of, yeah. uh, of, of rack singles. Still a load more to go. I had my eye on a few of my uh, uh, missing Susie Quattro singles today, and uh, looking at the price for uh, Rolling Stone. All oh, right, is that expensive? Uh, the only one I saw on uh, eBay was eighty-four pounds. Bloody hell! Yeah, but uh, and there's no the one on Discogs. They're all loads of copies available at good prices abroad. But I, I didn't buy buy anything from abroad. No, uh, no. <clears throat> but the. Uh, yeah, uh, the V one from a UK cell was forty five pounds. Yeah, so it's uh, expensive to get that first thing. There's another single called a uh, uh, Primitive Love, but that's only on promo. Right, uh, right. It was actually didn't actually come come out as a standard forty five. I've never seen that, and I guess that'd go for a fortune if it's only only, only a promo. But uh, yeah, I've got a few later ones. I, I I didn't, I hadn't realised, but she had a few songs which only made the uh, <clears throat> made the 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 bubbling under charts in uh, no, the UK. So the oh, right, singles right. in in the seventies. I'd not uh, silly titles. One of them, uh, but. Uh, but I I don't have those. So I'll I'll have to pick those up at some time. But remembering back, I mean, this is uh, I've actually got no notes at all because I can pretty much re- re- remember this. And it was it it was uh, amazing seeing seeing it on there. It's just a really great single. Went out, bought it straight away after seeing it on at, at top of the pops. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which is where we used to pick up on me as uh, we said we always say, don't we? You know, it yeah, was yeah. A, it was a different time then. What what was and if you didn't hear it on Radio One, which we would have, uh, the thing which would seal the deal for you to spend your uh, hard earned 
uh, pocket money? Um, according to Susie, she uh, she attributes her breakthrough to uh, touring as the warm up act for Sladen and Lizzie on a sort yeah, of package that's right. tour they're yeah. doing. But um, and, and as a last note on it, um, Nikki Shin says that can the can means something that is pretty impossible. You can't yeah. get one can inside another. They're the same size. So we're yeah. saying you can't put your man you can't put your man in the can if he's not willing to commit. Which uh, I suppose makes sense, but at the time I didn't really care about that. It was just a great song. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, just to add, is that uh, she, her first single, Rolling Stone, was with uh, with with Mickey Most in in charge. He found the song. He 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 produced it. Uh, as you said, it had bombed. Didn't didn't. Do do anything? Obviously, the next single, "Primitive Love," which didn't even get released. Well, I think again was Mickey Most and was going nowhere, and they decided to go with a change, a, a Chapman. And she said, when she heard it after they recorded it, she just knew it was going to be a hit. It just sounded, you know, at, at the time it was going to be a no a. a be kidding she is right yeah 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 so dear listeners that was the top 30 for this for this week in 1973 as said at the start of the show um if you wish to listen to this top 30 and it's well worth listening to there will be a playlist down below don't forget to like and subscribe so then we can make more of these sort of shows if you want to hear them um and to click the bell icon and uh I don't think we've decided on what to do next, but it might be interesting to do a 1980s chart at one point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, on that note, we hope you enjoyed the show. We hope you enjoy the chart if you listen to it, and we'll see you next time. Yeah, I certainly en- enjoyed it, re- reading up the stuff. It's good. Uh, yeah, yeah. found some new stuff, and you're off now to listen to uh, Steve as well. I, guess. I am indeed. In fact, another good chart, a uh, good, uh, good era to uh, do the chart from would be the punk era, because there were some good singles in the chart in the punk era. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, bye, bye, listeners. See you next time. <laughs>